Well, welcome everyone to this new session of Great Talks. Again, it's a pleasure to have the collaboration with IO Talent. And we have the privilege today of having with us Dr. Daniel Lopez Acuna, who is the former director of the Health Action in Crisis at the World Health Organization, WHO, and lecturer, lecturer at the Andalusian School of Public Health in Granada, Spain. Today, uh, IO Talent is going to discuss the access to the future COVID-19 vaccine, particularly in poor countries, and the confrontation between multilateral approach as advocated by the WHO against the unilateral production and distribution as announced by US, Russia, and China. Uh, Xiao Nuan will introduce our guest speakers today from uh, Southwestern University of Finance Economics in China. So please, Xiaonen and Manuela Tortora, you have the floor now. Yes, thank you, Alejandro. I will immediately give the floor to Xiaonen to introduce our three presenters. And, uh, and then after the presentations, I think uh, we will have the comments by Dr. Daniel Lopez Acuna. And of course, the debate, as usual, is open to everybody. And if you have questions or comments, do not hesitate to write it on the right column, on the chat column. I will try to moderate the, the debate to put some order in that. But please do not be shy and write whatever you think is worth to be discussed. So, Sionan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro and Manuela. Uh, firstly, it's our honor to meet the, meet the seniors from uh, Great Sales and also the professor. And from our side, we are also honored to uh, invite Southwestern University of Finance and Economics to co-organize the activity with us. So uh, we have three presenters today. The first one is Sherry Yuan, junior of uh, SU of Finance and Economics. And she is majoring in financial engineering and also interested in international relations and cultural comparison. And the second one we have is uh, Chen Sirui. And she is majoring in accounting and uh, interested in international development and also human rights. The third one we have Pu Rong. She, uh, she is majoring in accounting also and she's interested in international supervision mechanisms in administration processes. So uh, I think firstly, we will uh, welcome Sherry Yuan to make the presentation first. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, not yet. No. Yeah. Okay, uh, then I'll start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, in case you're at anywhere in this world. I am <laughs> Sherry from Southwestern University of Finance and Economics in China. I am a junior uh, majoring in financial engineering. Um, today I'm very honored and today delighted I'm honored. to join this conversation with so many extraordinary experts and students to share my opinions about the access to future COVID-19 medicine. Definitely, for everyone living on this planet, this is a very important and urgent issue that should be handled appropriately and effectively. For the outbreak of this epidemic has caused millions of deaths. Um, people can't have their normal life. Economies have been shut down. The whole world is struggling to function. However, immediately the outbreak started, had the research and development of vaccine begun. It's without doubt that the vaccination will play a vital role in preventing the virus from reproducing. But right now, the varied context within every country determines that some people are not able to get access to the future vaccine timely. There are many reasons the research and development of safe and effective vaccine are still on the way. The limit of manufacturing capability at this time indicates that the definite scarcity of future vaccine in short coming period. Besides, other factors that may potentially keep the world under the threat of COVID-19 are still worrying the international society, such as 
the, uh, the unilateralism on the production and uh, distribution of future va uh, vaccine, the ineffectiveness of international cooperation, let alone the uncertainty and risk brought by mutation of the virus itself. Therefore, the sooner the international consensus on production and the distribution of COVID-19 vaccine is reached, the less laws human will undertake. So let's get back to today's topic. The access to future COVID-19 vaccine, multilateralism versus unilateralism from the perspective of public goods. And the whole presentation will be structured as follows. First, we'll get to know the two main approaches that international organizations and countries have proposed. Then we'll analyze sorry. the starting points and... Uh, uh -huh. Can me? Oh, sorry, uh, I'm just... Uh, wanna, did you suppose to uh, like share the screen? Do you have PowerPoint to share? We cannot see your screen. Uh, you can see my screen. No, we can. You have to choose the green button and then confirm at the blue button. At the button. Oh, oh, okay. I think. Okay, okay. Is that okay? Can you see the PowerPoint? It's coming. Yes, yes. Okay, then can I continue? Well, yes. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, the whole presentation will be structured as follows. First, we'll get to know the two main approaches that international organizations and countries have proposed. Then we'll analyze the starting points and objectives of different propositions, focusing on the conflicts. Later, we'll discuss the whole issue from the perspective of public goods. And maybe in the end, we'll find something to inspire the world on how we should do on the access to vaccine. And first, for the production and uh, distribution of future COVID-19 vaccine, there is, a uh, there is a multilateral approach led by international organizations, COVAX. Um, is the vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator led by CEPI, GAVI, and WHO. Its aim is to um, accelerate the development and uh, manufacture of COVID-19 vaccines and to guarantee fair and equitable access for every country in the world. With the method offered by COVAX, the production and distribution of COVID-19 vaccine will be carried out in a global in a global way, with fair allocation mechanism. The COVAX the COVAX facility will bring all participating countries together, regardless of their income level, for the uh, procurement and uh, distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. The framework. Um, for allocation of COVID-19 pandemic health products is of great importance for it offers the world a very systematic scheme. Here I'll introduce it briefly. It's proposed that the overarching goals of protecting individuals and health systems and minimizing impact on societies and economics should drive the allocation process for COVID-19 health products across different countries. While resources remain scarce, uh, immunization programs will have to prioritize certain groups over others before progressively expanding access to all who can benefit as supply increases. At this point of pandemic, a reasonable scenario would be that while the supply of COVID-19 vaccines remains very scare, scarce, Countries should focus initially on reducing uh, mortality and protecting the health system. And the next step is identification of corresponding target groups to maximize impact with limited supply. In supply constrained situations, target groups are those identified 
um, through the goals and objectives for vaccination as those who should receive the vaccine sooner than others. The definition of target groups should be based on the most thorough analysis of global um, epidemiology and the scientific evidence based on a specific product profile, while the product supply remains limited. Target groups should be grouped into tiers one that would have progressive access to the vaccine based on descending priority. Tires may be composed of different target groups that are considered as having similar priority. Tire one may be limited to few type target groups, but all population groups that would benefit from access to a vaccine should have access to the vaccination in due time and be included in subsequent tires. Besides the priority of target groups, the allocation priori um, priori uh, pri Orientation across countries is proposed to be introduced in two phases. In phase one, doses will be allocated um, proportionally to all participating countries. And in phase two, consideration may be given to a country's risk to establish the pace at which they would receive additional volumes. However, some countries refuse to join this global COVID-19 vaccine effort. The United States has already said no, while Russia's attitude is still remains unclear. Countries with wealth and strength are seeking a unilateral way of producing and distributing, distributing vaccines. They tend to carry out the research and development of vaccine alone and take initiatives of vaccine production and trade. At the same time, if those superpowers are the first to develop an effective vaccine. They will control the pricing power and decide who they'll sell the vaccine to. Therefore, it's possible that people who need vaccine can't get access to it, but it's in a uh, surplus in some countries. Here, we consider it as a vaccine nationalism. It's obvious that the objectives of these two approaches are different. And now we'll analyze the conflicts of them. For COVAX or the multilateralism, it's more concerned about equality and the safety of all humanity. The protection of human rights outweighs uh, the very interest of a specific country um, from their perspective. The most urgent and significant purpose for uh, multilateralism is the elimination of disease and the best way to achieve that requires full international cooperation. On this topic, it's the full participation of all countries in the fair allocation mechanism proposed by the WHO. However, as nationalism rises these days, some countries are getting unwilling to cooperate for they can't get much benefit from that. From the perspective of nationalism, the production and distribution of COVID-19 vaccine is not just a health issue. First, countries with high probability of develop its own vaccine alone may have a high demand of domestic priority, which means they are reluctant to give their doses to foreign citizens, while some national citizens remain non-immune and this might be conflicting with the allocation principles proposed by uh, the WHO. Second, if a country has a monopoly on vaccine, then it will uh, possess the right of pricing, which gives the vaccine a commercial attribute, attribute, while it should ideally be a public good. What's more, the availability of vaccine also determines whether the economy and society can recover as soon as possible. So the worst situation will be that the country which has a monopoly on vaccine refuse to offer vaccine exchange with some countries that they have bad relation with. In that case, vaccine will become the tools of political combat. So in a world um, multilateralism represented by the international organizations wants a safe and peaceful world with rational skin functioning well, where everyone's fundamental right is respected 
and protect it. While nationalism only cares about its own country's benefit and tends to stop other power in this world from progressing. This conflict has been seen a lot in today's world and has caused much ineffectiveness in international cooperation. For example, the global environmental governance, the withdrawal of USA from many international treaties on uh, climate governance leaves the whole action inoperative, bringing huge extern uh, externality. But it's still important to seek effective international cooperation. And it's never possible for a country to refuse all cooperation in all time. Admittedly, as long as international cooperation can provide country with enough benefits, the negative effect of nationalism might be alleviated, which means there's still a chance of full effective cooperation. So I think the key point of solving this conflict is to make the international cooperation more beneficial. To have a further discussion, I want to firstly introduce the global public goods. First, for its definition, actually it still remains controversy. Common understanding will be like as follows. For a good to be recognized as global public good, it must exhibit three properties. The good must be non-rivalrous, -rival, uh, and its consumption by a person or entity must not reduce the quantity present. The good must also be non-excludable, making it impossible to deter anyone from using it, even if they were not involved in the good's production. A global public good must, have, uh, must also be available more or less worldwide. So from this definition, a virus-free international health environment will be the global public good we are concerned today. Then the supply and consumption of global public goods will be the center of attention, to which the key is international cooperation and, coordinate, and coordination. Generally, the supply models of global public goods can be divided into three categories. The virus-free international health environment belongs to the one called the weak supply. That is, global public goods are supplied by those who are vulnerable. For example, measures to prevent the spread of disease and avoid international terrorism. Since the strength of many international public goods, such as international order, depends on a large depends to a large extent on the weakest link, it is essential to link all countries together, in particular by enhancing the capacity of vulnerable member states, such as by providing them with assistance to develop their national capacities. However, to achieve this, a fair and rational allocation mechanism should be guaranteed. And for strong countries with better capa capability of research, development, and manufacture, it's unavoidable to offer more, more than countries that are relevantly weak. Consequently, although some countries can obtain the global public goods, i.e. the virus-free international environment, the relevant benefit of every country differs. The differences could be huge or tiny, depending on the complex international and domestic situation. And I think that may partly explain why some superpowers are not interested in COVAX. But let's have the consumption. If the relevant benefit of joint and international effort exceeds the gain of acting alone, the multilateral way might be more attractive for superpowers. That is, if the international health scheme, including the allocation mechanism of health production, the monitoring uh, and predicting system of disease, and so on, is more effective, or to be more specific, the cost of a COVID-19 vaccine is cheaper within the COVAX, there might be more superpowers willing to join. At last, we come to the conclusion. Multilateralism is what we considered as essential factor when it comes to sustainable development. I think we should spare no efforts to enhance that. 
and、uh, there are three words I think we should pay more attention to. First, it's sta-、uh, stability. The stability of all international cooperation increases with the number of membership. Today, China has claimed to join COVAX. As the first country to detect COVID-19, China has a very high level of high、uh, probability of developing the vaccine successfully, and this is definitely a good news for international society, making the whole mechanism、um, and the whole operation more stable and promising. Second is effectiveness. The effectiveness of international mechanism is what we should improve, for it's the key point. Of attracting more countries, especially the superpowers. Third is the decision-making power.、Um, the international cooperation might consider giving more self-decision power to country and allow each country to have more proper and appropriate preference in cooperation. In that way, maybe the nationalism might have some time and space to come down. Um, that's the end of this presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Shari.、Uh, so, secondly, we would have、uh, Chen Siri to give her presentation. I believe she will deliver her ideas from a different perspective. Siri, please. Please stop sharing your video. Uh, can everyone hear what I'm saying? Yes. Okay.、Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience.、Uh, can you see my screen? No, not yet. Oh,、uh, okay. Maybe there's something wrong with my. Click the、uh, green button and then confirm with the blue button. Okay, how about now? There it is. Okay. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. I'm Chen Siri from Southwestern University of Finance and Economy, majoring in accounting. My speech will focus on the human rights issues.、Uh, we all know that 2020 is not an easy year. The coronavirus pandemic has already wreaked devastation, causing more than a million deaths and and disrupting billions of lives. If countries can get good vaccines, they can save million lives. In some estimates, save 375 billion in global economic activity every month. But new human rights issues will arise if and when a vaccine is available. On what basis will people be prioritized to receive it? After all, a vaccine could be a ticket to restoration of civil life. Liberties and economic freedoms, as well as protection against life-threatening disease, it could, be, could well be the most anticipated medical breakthrough in history. Those states、uh, with the most efficient and wealthy health systems are likely to be prioritized, as they will be the most able to access or manufacture the vaccine, and organize and manage mass. Vaccination. Those most at risk of death, such as elderly or those with certain conditions like diabetes, would justifiably be prioritized, with perhaps a sliding scale down to those least at risk, such as healthy teenagers and children. In order to solve the problem of distribution, there are currently two solutions in the world. Covax, formerly known as the COVID-19 Vaccine Global Access Facility, 
is a global collaboration for speeding up the development, manufacture, and the equipable distribution of new vaccine. Countries that sign on COVAX will get, get access to a broad portfolio of new vaccine candidates to combat the SARS virus that caused COVID-19. Last month, the WHO said it was engaged with 172 countries and uh, vaccine developers were engaged in the COVAX process. Of the 156 countries have joined the global vaccine scheme, 16 four or are recognized as higher income nations. However, absent are superpowers, the United States, Russia, as well as France and Germany. Dialogue is reported to be continuing, but Russia has been concentrating on developing their own vaccines. France and Germany, through officially part of the global collaboration, have already made deals with medical companies to secure vaccines for their population and will not purchase them through the international efforts. The two efforts seem to have no problem, but from the perspective of human rights, they are worlds apart. Uh, what we call human rights is a right to life and liberty, freedom from slavery and torture, freedom of opinion and expression, the right to work and education, and many more. COVID-19 has effects that go beyond national borders. The right to life and the right to health of everyone on this global has potentially at risk. And this calls for global responses. The health crisis is a legit legitimate issue of international concern. These effects will field in a rich countries that have sufficient human, uh, financial, and material resources to deal with the crisis. They are also fields in countries in South with weak, understaffed, under-equipped, and under-financed health se sectors that do not have enough capacity to treat thousands of patients who often belong to the vulnerable part of the society. Capacity issues are particularly acute for countries with high foreign debit burden who are unable to afford extra expenses for medical ex equipment. Similarly, many of these countries do not have enough physical space to finance uh, social protection measures for those who have lost their jobs as a result of the pandemic. In my view, there are um, human rights issues which require, as a matter of urgency, a response based on international human rights law and global cooperation. Article 55 and 56 of UN Charter provide for the duty of states to cooperate in solving health problems and promoting universal respect for human rights. Article 2 of the International Covenant of and economic, social, and cultural rights obliges state parties to cooperate and assist each other in realizing the common rights. Among them, the right to health. In terms of giving effect to such duties, the notion of extraterritorial human rights obligations developed over the last two decades constitutes an important legal and conceptual contribution. COVAX is called by the Vaccine Alliance, CEPI, and the World Health Organization, working in partnership with developed and developing country vaccine manufacturers. These initiatives are in line with the general extraterritorial human rights obligation to create an environment, enable environment conducive, conducive to universal fulfillment of economic, social, and cultural rights, and the need for states to co coordinate and allocate responsibilities between different actors. As WHO said, we have two choices, vaccine nationalism, where a lot of people are vaccinated in a handful of countries, or vaccine multi multilateralism, where we protect at risk populations in all countries and keep our e economies working. 
barriers to equipment, equitable access are partly driven by vaccine nationalism with government seeking to use law to secure priority access to future vaccines through advanced purchase agreements with vaccine manufacturers. Those bilateral legal agreements can be a nation's interest, but given the uncertain success of individual of the 19 vaccine candidates and global spread of SARS-CoV-2. Those agreements are, are a gamble and inroad collaboration between countries. Importantly, such bilateral legal agreements are likely to contribute to inequalities and potentially ex ex extend the pandemic's time frame. By contrast, Multilateral legal agreements could be the path back to the global health security and justice by, by re-establishing norms of international solidarity, committing to global equip, equitable vaccine access initiatives, and laying a fundamental for past pandemic era built, built on multilateralism and cooperation. Uh, the new model developed by Northeastern University in the United States help explain why. Researchers at the university ask two situations. One is to dis uh, distribution, distribute uh, vaccines to all countries based on the proportion of population. The other is the situation like the reality we face. About 15 rich countries and regions have obtained 2 billion doses of vaccine. In second scenario, the new coronavirus will continue to spread uncontrollably for four months in three quarters of the world. Compared to the first case, the number of deaths caused by this will be twice of the former. What is currently being staged is, a, is an international bidding war, which is almost the same as a crew market battle at, in the global competition for ventilators and personal protective equipment at the beginning of the pandemic. Countries are struggling to negotiate with the medical companies to ensure that vaccines are purchased as soon as they are on the market. And as, the, as in all bidding wars, the richest bidders are winning. In fact, high-income countries in the world have already picked enough vaccine doses to cover more than twice of their own population. But what about low- and middle-income countries, from South Sudan to Myanmar, and so on? Those countries are home to nearly half of the world's population, but they do not have the purchasing power to make large deals with those medical companies. Judging from the current reality, the doses that these countries can obtain can only cover up to 12% of their population. Poor countries will suffer the most, but rich countries will not spare. Even though there is an oversupply of vaccines, there is still a risk of reinfection and epidemics in rich countries. Because in those places, not everyone will choose to be vaccinated. Uh, no country can be in isolation amid this pandemic. The only way to eliminate the threat of this disease anywhere is to eliminate, eliminate it everywhere. So the most urgent task now is to bridge the uh, vaccine gap between rich and poor countries, because in this pandemic, there's no difference between helping oneself and helping others to provide poor countries with the tools they needed to eliminate this disease is self-interest while altruistic. The sooner the world realizes this, the sooner this crisis will end. That's all my speech. Thanks for your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Sri. Uh, before the discussion, we would have the third presenters uh, Purom to do her presentation.
Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pu Rong, a second grade student from Sufi major in accounting. It's my great honor to be here and make a presentation on the access to the future of COVID-19 vaccine, and I will on focus, focus on supervision mechanisms in multilateral agreements. So my presentation is divided into four parts, including the background information, the supervision mechanisms, the shortcomings in that, uh, the supervision mechanism in UN and the shortcoming in that system and my breath conclusion. So in the first part, I want to give you a breath introduction of the COVAX. The COVAX is the vaccine pillar of the access to COVID-19 tool accelerator. The access is ACT Accelerator is a groundbreaking global collaboration to accelerate the development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatment, and vaccines. COVAX co-led by Gavi, the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, and WHO. Its aim is to accelerate the development and the manufacture of COVID-19 vaccines and to guarantee fair and equitable access for every country in the world. So why do we need COVAX? Developing a vaccine against COVID-19 is the most pressing challenge of our time, and we are unlikely to call it a victory against this global epidemic until the last country is free from the virus. The virus knows no borders and makes no distinction of ethnicity. The global pandemic has already caused the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives and disrupted the lives of billions more. So as well as reducing the tragic loss of lives and helping to get the pandemic under control, introduction of a vaccine will prevent the loss of US dollar 375 billion to the global economic every month. Global equitable access to a vaccine, particularly protecting healthcare workers and those most at risk is the only way to mitigate the public health and the economic impa impact of the pandemic. However, the reality is far from being ideal. We are facing a challenge that the vaccine are, de are developed and sold by several major countries and developing countries may not be able to obtain those health cares, guaranteeing thus a mechanism that can provide vaccines equ equally to all countries the world is essential. So during this process, as we can see, in international aid programs and multilateral agreements, supervision mechanisms are crucial. It is extremely unrealistic to call, talk about peace and equality without a regulatory mechanism. Currently, the supervision systems we can take as an example is, the, is what adapted in the United Nations. The UN Human Rights Treaty plays an important role in implementing human rights successfully. Its specific operating system includes the reporting system of the power parties, the system of allegation of communication amount among countries and a system of individual complaints and the investigation of system of convention institutions. However, due to the complexity of international human rights issues, the influence of international political factors and the United Nations human rights protection mechanism itself for the supervision system of United Nations human rights treaties, there is a long distance between the implementation and the actual effect. Well, having said that, let's take a look of the system itself first. For the specific operation of the United Nations Human Rights Treaty Supervision Mechanisms, there are two specific relevant operating systems. The first one is the contracting party reporting system, which is the most universal method in the treaty monetary system. 
most human rights treaties have established a reporting system, which has been widely used even before the establishment of the United Nations. Reports on the implementation of the treaty shall be submitted and all reports shall be sent to the Secretary General of the United Nations for con consideration by the treaty monetary agencies. Well, at the same time, it will also prevent the violation of human rights treaties by the power parties. Parties can, with the help of the treaty monetary agencies, understanding the differences between their own human rights protection legalization and the practices with the whole human rights treaties in multilateral agreements and deepen their understanding of this provision of human rights treaties. The second one is the allegation and the communication systems. It means that one of the contracting states can complain to the treaty body that another contracting party has not fulfilled its treaty obligations. The treaty power provides good platforms to the parties on the issue alleged by the contracting states in order to solve the problems. It is essentially a system of recognition. However, due to the limited scope of application of the system, weak implementation measures and a poor practical application, power parties in international human rights treaties seldom use these systems. So uh, use this interstate complaint system, such as the interstate complaint systems uh, stipulated in the International uh, Conference on Civil and Political Rights is never activated. So let's take a look of the COVAX. So on June 23rd, 2020, 45 civil society organizations wrote to Gavi board members emphasizing their concerns about the proposed mechanism. The latter pointed out that the initiative reflects the fact that Gavi and the governments have not fulfilled their previous commitment to dis dis design the new coronavirus vaccine as global public product. Adding that in, co in accordance with the usual practice of intellectual property rights, pharmaceutical companies can retain and obtain the relevant rights of the vaccine being developed. So that a vaccine is exclusive and subject to monopoly control of the individual companies. Since the way in which intellectual property is handled during the pandemic has not changed, Pharmaceutical companies can modelize future new coronavirus vaccines and decide who can get a vaccine. At the same time, the latter also pointed out so far the design of the access mechanism is not being transparent at all, and the first transaction with AstraZeneca is not transparent. In addition, there is also legal worries. Currently, COVAX works with the traditional pat patent system, which is the Latin patent holding companies charge, whatever the market will bear. So I believe this is a problem in part because about 80% of drug manufacturing is in genetic and we cannot utilize this cap cap capacity if companies keep their patents. Patents are monopoly protections that prevent companies manufacturing generic, generic, generic drugs from competing with companies that hold that patents. They thereby constrain access and let companies increase prices. This is better to reward companies for their contributions in other ways, perhaps on the basis of their global health impact. There should be no patents in the pandemic. And as a result, during the, this aiding process, the regulatory mechanisms for legal accountability also need to be taken seriously. So in conclusion, 
the idea of COVAX is really noble, but it's politically naive and the supervision mechanism is some kind of insufficient. Under the pandemic influence uh, preparedness framework, the only international legal instrument for the global equitable distribution of vaccine, which is WHO, intends to distribute vaccine that are secured under the contracts with manufacturers to countries on the basis of public health risk and need. However, in a pandemic with the restrict supply of available vaccines, public health needs all alone is unlikely to guide decisions, especially in the early stages of vaccines distribution when supply will be limited and uh, need will be equally high in multitudes of countries. Furthermore, unlike pandemic influenza, there is not an international legal instrument agreed by all WHO member states for Corona-19, nor there is there yet public international agreement on how distribution of COVAX facility or alternative platform vaccines should occur. WHO has developed a proposal for global framework to ensure uh, equitable and a fair allocation of COVID-19 products, highlighting how a global access mechanism would distribute risk and maximize equitable allocation between countries. However, the legal process and the form of adoption of such a framework is not being publicized, proposed. Despite the lack of specific international agreements for COVID-19 vaccines, 171, 72 countries now already have illegally binding obligations under the International Conference COVID-19 uh, on economic, social, and cultural rights to take steps individually and through international applications. To realize the rights to health and the rights to enjoy benefits of scientific researches and its applications without discrimination. Respecting, protecting and fulfilling these rights in the context of COVID-19 would mean ensuring that COVID-19 vaccines are available, accessible, acceptable and of good quality in all countries. Multilateral commitment is needed to help prevent an add additional legal risk arising from vaccine national render multilateral and some bilateral AP APAS in in ineffective, such as the use of government export controls. During the tw 2009 influenza AH1 and one pandemic, governments in HICs with vaccines manufacturers restrict export of vaccine until domestic needs has been met. As a result, even when governments or international institutions have entered into APAS, vaccines nationalism is the country of manufacturer could embark or requestion vaccines delay global distribution. Any international government platform for COVID-19 vaccine, including the COVAX facility or a new mechanism, will only success if there is a global more supervision mechanism and a commitment to global equit equitable COVID-19 vaccine access, particularly for HIS. Yet, many HICS are currently dividing the uh, professionalism of bi bilateral APAS, entrenching nationalism and di directing the future vaccine distribution. In November of 2020, uh, countries will meet of the, for the third, second part of the pandemic segment WHA. The meeting might be the last chance all countries have to adopt an international instruments and agree a mechanism for COVID-19 vaccines before being available. Any international COVID-19 vaccine allocation framework 
even as the non-binding resolution must establish government principles, including accountability, transparency, and conduct, and set principle and a mechanism for equitable distribution within and importantly between opportunity to choose the world. Finally, and at the G20 in late November 2020, -ish, ICS has a crucial opportunity to choose the world we will face if successful COVID-19 vaccines are developed. One where, where law is not a barrier, but a tool for achieving global health equity with justice. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Pearl. Uh, so this is the end of our uh, three presentations. And I give back the floor to Manuela. And we welcome the comments as well as the questions. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you particularly to the three presenters. They did an amazing job, uh, very detailed, very accurate, and with uh, uh, really reaching to the substance of the issue. So I immediately give the floor to Dr. Daniel Lopez Acuna for your own reactions and comments. While as a, as a reminder, you can write your comments and questions on the chat column. Dr. Lopez Acuna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? If you could put the volume a little bit higher, it would be better, I think. I will do. I will do that in just give me two seconds and I will put the volume higher. Yes, it's a bit too low. Fine. It is fine now. That's fine. Yes, very thank you. Good. Very good. Very good. Well, first of all, thank you very much to, to Grey Cells and to Grey Talks for inviting me to comment in this session. Uh, so I appreciate very much and as always delighted to collaborate with you. Second, let me congratulate the, the three presenters for very comprehensive, well, well, well thought and well built presentations with thorough reviews of the different, uh, I would say, initiatives that we are facing today for this very complex issue of, in, of ensuring universal access to a vaccine or some types of vaccines that uh, may be available with safety and efficacy. Um, it's a complex issue, this issue of the vaccines, and it's a complex issue, the issue of the access to the vaccines. Uh, so I, I think it was, it's been very good to have a thorough review with different angles and perspectives, with different uh, criteria for looking at the pros and cons of the different initiatives and for extracting some conclusions out of that. Let me uh, try to, to get into some specifics about uh, some of the things that I heard in the presentations and of the things that I observe in the development of the initiatives related to the vaccine and to, the, of, of, and to guaranteeing the access or the universal access to the vaccine. Uh, well, first of all, I think it's very important to comment that uh, global health security, and this is, I think, a very important concept, is a global public good. And we need to make sure that we contribute with the different instruments to the objectives of this global public good. Uh, we want a situation, a health security situation that is positive for all people in, in the world, but this implies an interdependent and multilateral construct that is not always present and is not always there. Uh, yes, it's in principle what should be there according to the objectives of the Constitution of the World Health Organization, 
but it's not necessarily what it's always there in terms of the real politic of what the member states of the World Health Organization do or play. Now, I say this because I think we need to, to frame very clearly the issue that the objective of the global public good of global health security is to secure the better health for the people of the world by preventing and curtailing a pandemic and by making available all the necessary instruments to reduce the transmission of a disease that is of epidemic and even pandemic nature like what we are facing with COVID-19. Therefore, the entire discussion about the vaccine or vaccines that will be available hopefully soon, but hopefully as well with very clear uh, adherence to the safety and efficacy that is necessary to put in place a vaccine, needs to be aligned and subordinated with the objective of the global public good of global health security. I think if we see the vaccines at, at large, but this vaccine that has to do with the possibility of curbing the transmission of a disease that is creating a pandemic in the world, if we see the vaccine as a private or pri uh, 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 private good that is just subject to the market and to the economic capacity to purchase it, we would be defeating the purpose of understanding the vaccine as a tool for contributing to the global public good. Now, the reality is that the vaccine is within markets and within prices and within a logic that is not necessarily following the global public good paradigm or framework. And reconciling these two things is in many respects, the tension that several of the presentations have highlighted between the unilateral and multilateral mechanisms, between the solidarity of the COVAX and the action that in a way is a bit of a social Darwinism of survival of the fittest and, and uh, access to the ones who have the greatest economic power to secure the access. And uh, I think this is part of the issue that internationally, multilaterally, we need to resolve in a better way than what we are resolving it these days. As many of you know, um, Although I didn't hear much, much reference to it in the presentations, I must say. Uh, the World Health Organization has one fundamental instrument that is one of the few binding agreements that is called the International Health Regulations. Its last uh, uh, version or edition was approved in 2005. It entered in, in effect in 2007, and in many respects, it's been the instrument that regulates the work of WHO. And when I say WHO, I'm not meaning only the Secretariat, but of the 194 member states that are part of WHO in connection with, in, uh, interna with public health events of international importance, including pandemics. The international health regulations uh, are very clear in the component that has to do with notification of diseases, sharing of the information, sharing of some of the normative and guidelines work in connection with stopping a pandemic, but it's not very, uh, very much involved into how to use the tools for curbing a pandemic and for bringing global health security, like a vaccine. And I think this is a point that deserves analysis and reflection. I must say, I would have loved that one of the presentations or uh, would have been about 
the relationship between the vaccines and the international health regulations, or that all of the three will have touched upon this. And, and, and this, please don't, don't uh, misunderstand me, is not by any means to, to diminish the quality and the rigor of the presentation, is just to say it's an additional element that we need to interrogate and to put in perspective for understanding better the relationship of the tools of an international binding elements that we have at our disposal. As you know, as mandated by the World Health Assembly in, in May, WHO has embarked in an independent evaluation or an independent panel to look at the way in which the pandemic has been managed and the implications that this has. It has just, at the beginning of this week, uh, in a special session of the Executive Board of WHO, the two co-chairs, former president of Liberia and former prime minister of New Zealand and former director of UNDP, Helen Clark, uh, have presented the framework with which this is going to be undertaken. And part of this review and part of this audit is precisely looking at the pertinence and relevance and appropriateness of the current international health regulations in connection with a pandemic situation like this. I personally have said in many media that in my view, the international health regulations need more muscle and more teeth, more mandate for the multilateral entity of WHO to intervene in the issues that are related to pandemic and not just to uh, have this uh, subsidiary approach where essentially the member states with a nation state concept have the sovereignty for making decisions when we are facing a situation that is affecting all and it shows an interdependence. But this is a long discussion where in order to move in a different direction, we need a, a real, a, I would say, a session a, or a, of, well, I, I, I would put it differently. I, we would need some granting of greater sovereignty to WHO for intervening in pandemic situations. And not all member states are for that cause, if I may say. But bottom line is, we have some weaknesses in the international frameworks that give sufficient power to entities like WHO for intervening more thoroughly into trying to come up with a common approach to combat the pandemic. And of course, this is reflected as well into the issue of the vaccine that is one of the instruments for tackling the, uh, the pandemic, for interrupting the chain of transmission, and for protecting people. Now, having said all this, uh, it seems to me that the logical action and development when we face a pandemic all over the world, and when we have this interdependence of the epidemiologic situation where what happens in one place affects the other place, is that we should have the vaccine as, a, as an instrumental tool for building health security. And this calls for more solidarity, multilateral approaches, and I would say the concept of a public good or common public good. It may sound naive, it is in a way naive with respect to the real politic and real economy, but it is something that we as countries, as member states, and we all as citizens of the world need to think more. We need a better architecture for public, uh, for global public goods in public health and for improving this infrastructure. In the absence of these things well connected with international health regulations, I think our best 
option, in my perspective, is to have a platform like COVAX, a, a multilateral platform, a solidarity platform, a platform that is attempting to create greater equity in the distribution of unscarce goods at the beginning, and maybe during a period of time. And that seeing this unilateral, nationalistic, and in a way, selfish approaches to developing, producing, and securing the access to the vaccine doesn't help to this cause and to this purpose. Uh, I think uh, it has been very unfortunate, for instance, to see the withdrawal of WHO from, from uh, sorry, of, of the US from WHO, I think associated to very political reasons that are very associated to the election year in the US this year, and the attempt to, to find a, a, a scapegoat in WHO of many of the problems faced internally by the Trump administration. But uh, over and above this, uh, the, the reality is that it has also been unfortunate to see that the countries like the US will not participate in a collective multilateral solidarity mechanism like COVID. Um, I mean, if you ask me, and, and I'm speaking with the experience of having worked 30 years for WHO, having been involved in many of these issues, having been director of health action in crisis, and being an epidemiologist, I would say I would like to see a real flourishing of the COVAX platform of the multilateral mechanism, of an, a mechanism that distributes with equity and that creates the appropriate prioritization for the use of the vaccine, first with the most vulnerable groups or groups that are at high risk of death or severe disease, and then extending it to ensure the protection of the population. I think. Uh, the, the first uh, presentation showed very clearly the, well, the, the, I would say the different angles and perspectives of the multilateral and unilateral mechanism, the importance of the public good concept. So I think it contributes to our thinking and, and, and reflection of the importance of having this mechanism in place. Now, uh, in the second presentation, there was the, a good description of the, of the COVAX mechanism and also of its good intentions, but uh, I would say sometimes weak instruments that are very much dependent of the goodwill and the solidarity. Uh, and when, when at the same time, despite of this mechanism, countries are in their race as if they were in, in, in the race to reach the moon uh, in developing and selling the vaccine. And also industry, it's uh, very much into a race for trying to secure the greatest shares of the market in terms of the vaccine. I think that uh, in this we need to put the horses in front of the cart and not the other way around and define the objectives of public health and epidemiology as the fundamental ones that should be making the vaccine subordinated I think I think we lost him. Maybe he will reconnect. Reconnected. Are you listening to me now? Yes, indeed, indeed. Okay, very good. No, I was saying that the third presentation, I think, introduced uh, in an interesting manner the issue of the Human Rights Treaty. I think it's good, it's useful, but I have to say that, in my view, uh, the very first uh, element of international covenant and legislation that we should be looking at is the international health regulations 
and that in, the, in a way human rights treaty comes uh, as a subsidiary well, element for this. Uh, I, I think uh, what we need to make sure is of building the instruments of COVAX in such a way that is not just a goodwill exercise. I, I don't know if it's a naive exercise, but at least a goodwill exercise, but it becomes an exercise with sufficient a convening power with sufficient ability to mobilize the necessary wills and resources to make sure that we have a more multilateral and I would say solidarity mechanism for the vaccine. Uh, I, I will insist just as the final point on something that I've been repeating in many media here in Spain and internationally when people start asking about, well, which vaccine is going to arrive first and how is the race and what's the situation? I say, well, let's be prudent. Let's be cautious. Let's give the necessary time for completing the phase three testing of the vaccine to ensure safety and efficacy of the vaccine. And once we have one, two or more vaccines available, Let's try to create the best possible approaches and mechanisms like the COVAX one for securing universal access, for applying an equity approach to it, for understanding who are the most vulnerable groups that ought to be prioritized for vaccination and to expand then uh, the production uh, in, in such a way that the vaccine becomes accessible. As far as I'm concerned, and I know I'm going to say something very provocative, uh, I would have zero hesitation in situating this within the realm of the compulsory licensing in such a way that there is no barrier in terms of patents for the appropriate access to the vaccine. Uh, I think the interest that we need to pursue, at least in my angle, in my perspective, and in my values, is the health of the people. And it's not neither the political or geopolitical interest of any country, nor the interest of, or, or, the, or the financial interest of manufacturing industries of the vaccine. I, I think this is a moment where society really needs to to adhere to higher values for preserving life and for having the appropriate solidarity among human beings. I think I'm going to stop my comments there and uh, will be happy to engage in dialogue or interact as you, as you wish. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lopez Acuna. Indeed, your remarks uh, really raised the global policy issues that need to be raised in relation to this pandemic and the vaccine distribution and production. Uh, at the beginning of uh, this uh, chat, uh, I think uh, Xiaon Wan referred to the announcement by the Chinese government that they are joining COVAX precisely today, as it was already announced in a preliminary fashion some days ago at the summit between the European Union and China. But can somebody confirm that? I don't know, one of the presenters maybe, or Xiongnan herself? Well, <laughs> we lost Xiongnan <laughs> in the meanwhile. But uh, it would be a great new, I mean, if it is confirmed indeed that China is officially joining COVAX uh, starting today. Xiong Wan, is, is it true that you, you saw the announcement? Yes, yes. Uh, just this morning uh, in Beijing time that uh, there is an announcement from the, um, uh, the person uh, of uh, the, the diplomat and announced officially. Announced that China is, is joining the COVAX initiative. Yes, right? yes. Well, very good news. What do you think, uh, Dr. Lopez Acuna? Well, these are great news. I am glad that this is happening. 
I think the more we have the, the countries that are leaving efforts uh, or are, are leaving uh, uh, researchers and producers of the vaccine like China, Russia, and the US and UK, the more we have them joining the multilateral platform, the better. We know that the US for the time being will not be uh, participating, but I think it is important that UK participates, that it's important that China participates, and that's important. That is important. I hope that Russia participates as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, I would like to to um, make a remark and well, or a question, uh, re in relation with the mechanism that uh, you mentioned, Dr. Lopez Acuna, and that was mentioned also in the presentations. And I fully agree with your comment regarding the relevance of the international health regulations as a starting point, instead of looking at the human rights uh, dimensions within the UN system, which is the only multilateral framework that we have at the end of the day in this planet. Uh, in this regard, I, uh, as you probably know, or some of you already know, I am a trade negotiator, a trade expert. So I look at the issues at the multilateral level from the trade angle. And my reference uh, here that I think is relevant are the World Trade Organization mechanisms to ensure the implementation of the international trade agreements that are much more sophisticated, much more elaborated, much more efficient also as compared to the international health regulations because they have more teeth. They even have a system of a tribunal and some sanctions for mm -hmm. the states that violate the rules. As you probably know, also the US is blocking now since uh, two years, three years now, the, the one part, one key component of that mechanism, which is the dispute settlement mechanism. But still, the engineering that we have on trade at international trade level is probably the more advanced and demonstrates that if we can, we, international community, we can agree on an engineering such as that one that proved to be very, very efficient in the last 20 years, why are not we be able to introduce a similar engineering in the area of health that mm -hmm. is obviously much more important than the area of international trade rules? So there is a sort of paradox there. It's not that we are, we are not able to produce anything because sovereignty still matters and so on. We are demonstrating that when economic interests are at stake, like on international trade agreements, we can reach quite a satisfactory uh, machinery and by far better than the one that we have on, on, on human rights even on environment, by, by the way, which is also an, a useful reference regarding multilateral rules. Uh, and also I would like to, in that context, uh, since I'm talking from the trade perspective, and since you mentioned intellectual property, uh, rights of the pharmaceuticals, which are uh, obviously at stake in the production and distribution of the vaccine. Uh, yes, indeed, the compulsory licenses uh, are so far being agreed as, as those that will cover the distribution of the vaccine because since the year 2002, within the WTO uh, trade rules, uh, epidemics and vaccines for epidemics are included and therefore excluded from the international rights protection obligation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the situation so far and I hope it will stay like this, but at least there on that front, we have already a legal mechanism that is already in place since almost 20 years that everybody is, is respecting more or less. And so the discussion should be, I hope, closed on that front. I hope so. But let's look at the implementation of, as you said, the, the, the vaccine as a public, uh, global public good, that is really what, what matters. And here I have a final question on the financing of COVAX. Some days ago, the Director General of WHO announced that there is a partial funding already been secured for the COVAX initiative, but it's not yet complete. It's one third, more or less, of the total budget that is needed. So it's also an issue of financial resources. Uh, and not only the, the legal issues or the, 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 the technical knowledge to produce the vaccine, is also the, the financial resources that need to be pooled at the multilateral level. Maybe you would like to say something about that, Dr. Lopez Acuña, in this regard? 
Uh, yeah. The sound is on. Yes. Yeah. Well, I I don't know what's exactly the the level of financing at this moment uh, of the of the Covax initiative. I know that countries have been adhering. Um, I mean, I. I'm very glad that you, you made the comment about the international property and the importance of adhering to the compulsory license, but I still would like to see that this happens. Uh, but in terms of the, of the mechanisms, I think uh, what is going to be very important is a full, fully-fledged funding of the COVAX mechanism and a real sound framework for equitable distribution of the available vaccine to the countries according to need. Uh, let's, I think, let's try to build in this direction. Uh, I think, uh, well, the fact itself that the Director General of WHO several times has made a reference of, to the importance of uh, enhancing these multilateral mechanisms rather than playing the nationalism in vaccine development and, and application uh, indicates that there are tensions out there and that is not going to be just a straightforward. I mean, we have experience in the World Health Organization, in regional offices of the World Health Organization, of developing common procurement mechanisms for drugs and for, for priority diseases and for uh, purchasing vaccines. I mean, in the region of the Americas, for many years, we developed in the World Health Organization a, 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 a how say, revolving fund for the purchase of the essential vaccines for the critical uh, immunizations of the expanded program of immunizations. Without that, countries would have had a huge difficulty to afford the vaccination that they needed to apply to the population. And thanks to that, I would say, it was possible, among other efforts, but thanks to that as well, to have the region of the Americas as the first one eliminating missiles in, in the world, in, 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 in the world, in the, in the continent. I mean, uh, something that was not necessarily done even in Europe at the same time. So, um, I think it's extremely important to understand that this financial mechanism uh, can play a very critical or instrumental role for advancing the objectives of public health programs. And there was also the development of a revolving fund for the purchase of drugs against tuberculosis, malaria, and AIDS, and also for insecticide against malaria that was extremely effective to reduce the prices and secure access and even if you allow me to say it very frankly among ourselves in this meeting, for breaking, breaking the cartels of the monopoly of the sale of insecticide in some countries in the Americas. So I think it is extremely important to, to learn from the experiences that we have in developing these mechanisms and to try to, to develop them as much as possible for the purpose of the COVID-19 vaccine and the control of the COVID-19 pandemic. I think I will stop there. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez Acuna. I do not see any comment nor question pending on the chat column. So I will give the floor back to Xiao Nuan and Alejandro to close this session that was uh, extremely formative, I must say. Thank you all. Alejandro, you have the floor. Your mic, Alejandro. My apologies for that. Well, I, I would like to join Manuela and Dr. Lopez Acuna for congratulating our guest speakers. I really think that their presentations were really very informative. Uh, thank you really very much again for participating one more time in a great talk, Dr. Lopez Acuna. 
you always are bringing in new information and new insights that really clarify matters to all of us. Uh, just one info information. We have been having some technical problems at uh, Gray Cells in recording our sessions. This one has been recorded and the previous one of last week was also recorded and they will be processed over the weekend so that they will be available to be heard and watched as from Monday of next week. Really, thank you very much, Xiao Nan. We are extremely grateful again with IO Talent for these joint intergenerational activities. And we're looking forward to have a next meeting with you soon. Thank you very much to all and have a great weekend. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.